Now to the war in Ukraine. Nukes are in the picture again. A Ukrainian drone has been shot down south of Moscow. That's deep inside Russian territory. And Kiev wants the United Nations to intervene. Not sure how it will help. But let's bring you up to speed with the developments one by one, starting with Russia's big announcement. It is planning to station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Russian President Vladimir Putin made this announcement on Saturday and it's got Ukraine scrambling. The Ukrainian Foreign Ministry has asked for an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council. It is asking the world to counter what it calls Russia's nuclear blackmail. I've got the statement from Ukraine with me. This is what it says. Ukraine expects effective measures to counter the Kremlin's nuclear blackmail by the United Kingdom, China, the USA and France in particular as permanent members of the UN Security Council. We demand to immediately convene an extraordinary meeting of the United Nations Security Council for this purpose. If the meeting is called, what will it yield? Nothing more than dramatic sound bites. Remember, Russia too is a permanent member of the Security Council. It has a veto power. So does China. So there won't be a resolution. At best, Ukraine can hope for a public rebuke of Russia. And Putin has already offered a justification. Here's why he says he's placing nukes in Belarus. Belarusian President Alexander Grigorievich Lukashenko has long raised the question of deploying Russian tactical nuclear weapons on the territory of Belarus. There is nothing unusual here either. First, the United States has been doing this for decades. They have long placed their tactical nuclear weapons on the territory of the allied countries, NATO countries in Europe. We agreed that we would do the same without violating our obligations. I'd like to emphasize this, without violating our international obligations on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. We do not transfer nuclear weapons, and the United States does not transfer nuclear weapons to its allies. We are doing what they have been doing for decades, stationing them in certain allied countries, preparing the launch platforms and training their crews. We are going to do the same thing. This is exactly what Alexander Grigorovich Lukashenko asked for. Putin may have a valid point. For years, Russia has proudly stated that it does not go around placing nuclear weapons in allied nations. That's not something that the U.S. can boast of. And now the change in Russia's policy may be hypocritical, but it has a precedent set by the U.S. How can Washington condemn something that it itself is guilty of? Well, it can, because it's Washington, and it has. NATO has called the plan, quote-unquote, dangerous and irresponsible. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell has threatened new sanctions on Russia and Belarus. And America's national security spokesperson John Kirby has said this. I can tell you that we've seen nothing that would indicate uh, Mr. Putin is uh, preparing to to use tactical nuclear weapons in any way whatsoever in, in uh, Ukraine. And I can also tell you that we haven't seen anything that would cause us to change our own strategic nuclear deterrent posture. Perhaps the U.S. knows it can't do much about Russia's plan without curbing its own activities. And perhaps Ukraine knows that Security Council intervention will be a non-starter. So it is directly appealing to the people of Belarus. Here's a statement from Ukraine's foreign ministry, and I quote... Ukraine appeals to Belarusian society to prevent the fulfillment of the criminal purposes regarding the deployment of nuclear weapons on the territory of Belarus, which will further turn this country into a hostage of the Kremlin. Quick fact. Belarus borders both Ukraine and Russia. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko is a close ally of Vladimir Putin. He is unlikely to allow Belarusian society to get in the way of Russia's nuclear plan. And what exactly is that plan? Putin wants to station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. What are those? There are two classifications of nuclear weapons, tactical and strategic. Tactical nukes are smaller. They're considered less dangerous than the larger, deadlier strategic nuclear weapons. And they can be used on the battlefield without obliterating everything. In contrast, strategic nukes are the ones used to level entire cities. You know, like the ones that the U.S. dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the Second World War. Those were strategic nuclear weapons. Tactical nukes are smaller. They can be used in a more limited capacity. So their impact is small. But that doesn't change the fact that they're still nuclear weapons. They're devastating. And placing them in Belarus would be an escalation by Russia. It would be a warning to Ukraine and its Western allies, telling them not to push Russia any further. 
This escalation comes amid news of another raging battle in the war in Ukraine. The battle for Avdivka. It's a small city near Donetsk in eastern Ukraine. Last week, Ukraine said it could become a second Bakhmut. Because like with Bakhmut, Russia has been trying to capture Avdivka by bombing it into submission. Over the weekend, it was on the receiving end of intense shelling. Officials say it's becoming more and more like a place from post-apocalyptic movies, which begs the question, what's the reason behind this sort of devastation? Could Russian bombardment be a retaliation for something? On Sunday, videos like this emerged from a town 220 kilometers south of Moscow. This is deep into Russian territory, some 300 kilometers from Ukraine. This is where a drone crashed. Russia says it was a Ukrainian drone. It lost control and crashed into the town. Three people were reportedly injured. Remember, Ukraine has always denied allegations that its drones have flown into Russian territory. It has never claimed official responsibility for attacks within Russian borders. But these attacks have been happening off and on, like last week's attack on a Russian base in Crimea. Could Russia be frustrated with these guerrilla-style attacks? Is it reacting by flattening Avdivka and placing nukes in Belarus? Whatever the reason, the war shows no signs of slowing down. And the world will continue to suffer till a solution is found. Now to our continuing coverage on Khalistani attacks against India. The latest one came in Canada in the city of Vancouver. It happened on Saturday. The Indian consulate in Vancouver was targeted. Hundreds of protesters showed up. They were demonstrating against some developments in India. Police in India have launched a manhunt. They are cracking down on the network of Amrit Pal Singh, a fugitive separatist, the new face of the Khalistani movement. The protesters in Canada were sympathizers of this Amrit Pal Singh all the way in Canada. And that should tell you something about how this nexus operates. And Canada continues to let it thrive. It wasn't the first such protest, by the way. The Khalistani sympathizers have been targeting the Indian High Commission in Ottawa and Indian consulates around Canada. In some instances, they breached the mission security. Now, India has raised the matter formally. The Canadian High Commissioner in New Delhi was summoned. An explanation was sought. In fact, I had that statement with me. This is what it says. The government of India sought an explanation on how such elements were allowed in the presence of police to breach the security of our diplomatic mission and consulates. It doesn't end there. New Delhi has made some specific demands. It wants Canada to order a crackdown, arrest the separatists and extremist elements and offer better protection to Indian diplomats and consulates. India has also reminded Canada about its obligations under the Vienna Convention. The expectations are quite clear. Last week, India's external affairs minister spelled them out. It is our expectation. As I said, you know, many countries are very casual about it. They have a, a different view about their own security and a different view about other people's security. But I can tell you, you know, as foreign minister, we are, we are, not, we are not going to accept these kinds of uh, uh, differential standards. The shift in India's posture is clear. It is taking a tougher line on Western patronage to Khalistanis. The Canadian envoy is the third diplomat to be summoned in this regard. Before him, top diplomats of the US and the UK were called. But Canada's case is far more serious. It is the hotbed of pro-Khalistan activities. Three months into 2023, we have witnessed multiple provocations from Canada. A temple in Brampton was vandalized. Again, Khalistanis were behind this. They spray-painted graffiti on the temple's walls. India condemned the incident. But little has been done to stop all of this. Canada's politicians are complicit. They're playing to the galleries, allowing Khalistanis to flourish to appease their vote bank. In fact, some of these politicians have been linked to Khalistanis. And the links run to the very top. You might remember this. In 2018, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, paid a visit to India. A dinner was organized in New Delhi and a convicted terrorist was on the list of invitees. The Canadian Prime Minister's wife, Sophie Trudeau, posed for a picture with the same man. His name is Jaspal Atwal. In 1986, he was convicted. He tried to kill Malket Singh Sidhu, then a minister in the Punjab government in India. After a backlash from New Delhi, the invitation was taken back. Then Justin Trudeau joined hands with this man, 
as his coalition partner. His name is Jagmeet Singh. He has made multiple appearances at pro-Khalistan events. Last year, he backed the Khalistan referendum in Canada. Recently, Singh's Twitter account was withheld. This was for comments about Amrit Pal Singh, the same fugitive in India. The pattern is quite clear. Canadian leaders are pandering to Khalistanis for votes. They're discussing developments in Punjab in the Canadian parliament. The government faced questions from the opposition in Canada. Canada's foreign minister gave a response, and I have a copy. Listen to what he said. We are aware of evolving, the evolving situation in Punjab, and we are following it very closely. We look forward to a return to a more stable situation. Canadians can always count on the government of Canada to make sure that we will continue to address the concerns of many members of the community. So Canada refuses to mend its ways. And as India builds pressure, frankly, it doesn't help that Amrit Pal Singh is still on the loose. Ten days and counting, the police have not been able to nab him. His Twitter sinking, it surely is going through a rough patch, and Elon Musk is the center of all the action. He has a reputation of being a radical businessman. You could call him a disruptor. He likes to take risks, make a lot of changes, and even more noise. And he has brought several changes to Twitter. But how has it impacted the platform? Twitter has lost most of its advertisers. Users are frustrated because Musk wants them to pay. And the platform has lost more than 50% in valuation. Remember, Elon Musk bought Twitter for $44 billion. He now says the company is worth just about $20 billion. How did this happen? And what is he doing to arrest this slump? Here's a report. Elon Musk took over Twitter in October last year. <laughs> he walked into the company's headquarters with a sink in his hand. The Tesla tycoon declared that the bird had been freed. Perhaps the sink was a sign of the days to come, because Twitter is now sinking. According to a leaked memo, Twitter's valuation has halved in just five months of Elon Musk's takeover. The microblogging platform was worth $44 billion when Musk took over, because that's what he paid to become the company's boss. However, he did say that he was overpaying for the social media platform. In fact, Elon Musk even walked back on the deal, claiming Twitter had misled him. But he eventually paid $44 billion, and now Twitter is worth $20 billion. Elon Musk has called Twitter under him an inverse startup. He claims he had to bring in a whirlwind of changes to save the company from bankruptcy. Be that as it may, Twitter is losing its value at a breathneck pace, despite Musk's supposed changes. And what are the changes Elon Musk has brought in? Quite a few, actually. They're having a cumulative effect on Twitter's valuation. Twitter is driven by advertising revenue. In 2021, Twitter earned $5.1 billion in revenue. 90% of it came from ads. But Elon Musk's takeover made Twitter's biggest advertisers run away. By January this year, 75% of them had stopped running ads on the platform. Ad revenue fell from $127 million to just about $48 million. And these advertisers are not obscure entities whose loss Twitter can take on the chin. They include the likes of Coca-Cola, General Motors, Jeep, Wells Fargo, and Unilever. Why did they dump Twitter? Because of Musk. They thought he would drastically alter Twitter's content moderation policies and that their ads would appear near controversial and sensitive content. Musk has also upset users. He's asking them to pay for Twitter Blue. It's the platform subscription offering, which can get any verifiable handle the blue check mark. Twitter Blue's initial launch late last year led to many fake handles getting verified, and that only made advertisers lose confidence. Musk is also restoring some suspended handles, like Donald Trump, Andrew Tate, Kanye West, and Jordan Peterson. Controversial names canceled for controversial reasons. Musk is bringing them back in the name of freedom of speech. He says his ultimate goal is to make Twitter a $250 billion company and that there's a clear yet difficult path to achieving that goal. What he's achieved in the first six months is quite the opposite. Twitter has lost half its value. So the $250 billion mark looks far-fetched. A lot depends on Musk's ability to woo advertisers back and make Twitter blue sale. 
Perhaps Twitter wasn't worth $44 billion after all, which means Elon Musk grossly overpaid for it, and it doesn't reflect well on the business genius he claims to be. Or perhaps Twitter did lose half its value, which also doesn't reflect well on the visionary disruptor he believes himself to be. Either way, the sync prank did not land well. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Starting with Ukraine, Russia has been trying to capture the city of Bakhmut, but it's not been able to do so. Ukraine has released new footage. It shows how the city has been reduced to rubble after intense fighting. Meanwhile, in Paris, the Louvre is a famous tourist attraction. You know that already. It is a historical landmark too, but tourists cannot enter because of the ongoing protests against pension reforms. Also in France... People are protesting in another city. They want to stop the construction of a giant water storage facility. Countries all over the world celebrated Earth Hour over the weekend. We'll show you some of those images. And finally, what happened today in history, the deadliest plane crash in the world of aviation. The year was 1977. Two Boeing 747 aircraft collided on a foggy runway. This happened in Spain. The collision led to a massive fire. 500 people died. We're leaving you with this. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.